You plan on ordering anything, friend? I'll take an ale, and something warm to go with it. Coming right up. Thank you. I hear there's something stalking the road leading through the mountain pass. That's what my scouts are reporting. Not that anyone has actually seen the thing. What do you mean? My men hear its cries on their patrols. They say its howls echo throughout the night. Whatever it is, the only tracks it leaves are deep gouges in trees and stones. You reckon you'll send the town watch after it? Not likely. I've only got two good scouts left. No point risking their lives hunting something that hasn't come near the village. Here's to hoping it stays that way. Hmm. Here's your order. Doing some eavesdropping, are ya? I hear there's a monster nearby. Has there been trouble on the road? When is there not? Word is that something's coming down from the mountains with the melting of the snow. Something that was frozen through the winter. The scout says it sounds hungry. I ain't heard it yet, though. If you ask me, I, I think they're making a monster up so they'll get a few extra coins for their service. What you writing there? Just some notes for when I investigate this. You a night hunter, then? I am. You didn't happen to cross paths with an agitated old man on your way in, did you? Sour-looking chap with a bad limp in his right leg. <sighs> That's the one. Where's the hunter? I saw him come in here. Lan, I told you not to come back if you were gonna cause a ruckus. You're not the only one with troubles, you know. You weren't there, Maria. None of you were. You can mock me all you like, but I know what happened in those mines weren't no ordinary cave-in. There's something down there, and it's wearing all their faces. Get out before I toss you out. If I may, I'm interested in what he has to say. It's nonsense. He thinks a moon spawn caused an earthquake and devoured the other miners. That kind of thing isn't unheard of. Around these parts it is. The merchant lords place better protection on the mines than they do on our homes. A pound of gold is worth tenfold a pound of flesh to them. Runes at the entrance don't matter much if it came from below. Final warning, Len. Out. Now. Would buying him a meal be fair compensation for your troubles? I wouldn't waste my coin if I were you. The man's half mad. <sighs> He's been through a lot, I'll grant him that, but that's no excuse to make everyone else's life worse by screaming delusions from one monster moon to the next. I'd like to hear his story all the same. Fine. But Len, if you cause a racket, I'm gonna drag you out by your bad leg. You're too kind. I appreciate your leniency. This could be very valuable to me. It won't be, but it's your coin. What's your name, Night Hunter? Dedris of Neria. Well, Dedris, it's nice to finally meet someone willing to hear me out. No one around these parts believes me. They think that just because we've got runes protecting something that it means it's got no weak spots. I used to think that too. But I know the nightmares I saw down there weren't dreamed up. Runes aren't as infallible as the merchants like to think. I'll grant you that. I'll listen to your story with an open mind. But as it stands, you look like you could be the senile old man Maria says you are. I see you still have some convincing to do. Still, seeing as I'll be talking to an educated man, I doubt that'll be difficult to do. Let's get started before Maria decides to stop tolerating you. If you'd like, where should I begin? Somewhere before your actual encounter with the Moonspawn. Every detail is crucial to helping me determine just what kind of creature this was. The mines here in Kaldberg run deep and wide. If you don't know how to navigate them, you'll end up lost in minutes. And it's unlikely you'll ever come back out. Apparently kings of the old world fought wars over the wellspring of riches tucked away beneath the mountain. Given how stripped of anything valuable the upper levels are, I'd say they skipped the fighting and just sent their armies down there. When we go mining, it's for days at a time. We have to go deeper than anyone before us to reach new veins of gold and silver. Just getting down there takes us the better part of a day. It started as a normal expedition. The merchants have over half the men and boys in town employed. That day there was me, Tomas, Orden, and his boy Will. Ah, never mind. If you want to know their names, I can take you on a walk through the graveyard. 
though their bodies are buried far deeper than six feet. In any case, we took stock of our inventory and we entered the mine. Orden led the way, following the thick lines of chalk we used to mark our way to the latest deposit we'd been working on. Fortunately for us, that deposit was proven to be quite the find. We'd been at it for weeks already and it still had more to offer. If the merchants don't get their gold, we don't get paid. Simple as that. A deposit so bountiful is always a welcome find. Unfortunately, getting to it took us through some unpleasant territory. You see, the upper levels are mined out right proper with solid supports and spacious passages. Some of the more lucrative tunnels even had mine carts brought in for transportation. Of course, we had to collapse some of the older passages over time to prevent them from collapsing on their own and affecting adjacent shafts. The lower levels don't get the same treatment. Below all the old shafts are natural tunnels smoothed out over years by underground rivers. They've dried up now though, and that's where we've been ordered to continue mining. What the merchants don't realize is how dangerous it is down there. Without the time or resources, we aren't able to properly stabilize the tunnels. We've told them as much, and asked to slow production so we can be methodical about our work. They didn't take kindly to that suggestion. Anyway, the larger tunnels are easy enough to stabilize and traverse, but it's the smaller ones that prove tricky. Some are so tight that a full-grown man can't squeeze through them. That's what we have the boys for. They scout ahead, taking their canaries with them for good measure. When they come back, they tell us if it's worth widening the passage enough for the rest of us and our equipment to fit through, or if we should move on to the next hole. We've lost a good lot of boys getting stuck in those gaps. Monsters are bad, aye, but at least most of them end you quick. There ain't nothing worse than having to sit there and comfort a boy twenty feet down as he starves, stuck there where we can't help him. More often than not, we have to leave him there before we run out of tallow to burn. You're a night hunter, Dedris. You and your kind wander the wilds at night. You know what the dark is like. Down there, in the belly of the earth, that's where the real darkness lives. Never disturbed by the sun. It'll devour you as sure as anything with teeth on a stomach will. Only difference is, you can't fight darkness. Bad as the moon spawn I saw was, it'll never haunt my dreams like the cries of the boys we left to die in the pitch black. All that's to say, it was a damn treacherous path to get to the latest deposit. Will was the one that found it in an offshoot tunnel. I still remember the look on his face when he wormed his way out of that crevice and told us to start digging. Took us several expeditions just to get to it. But when we did, by the kindler's flame, it was like we'd found the biggest, shiniest artery of the mountain had to offer. There wasn't much room in that tunnel, so we set up our sleeping rolls and set down our gear outside the makeshift shaft we'd constructed. Even with everything cleared out, it took us most of the first day just to get down to the deposit, so we decided it best to get some rest before getting to work. So we snuffed out our candles and went to sleep. When we woke, we began our work carefully. I was never so foolish to believe we were safe down there. Plenty of things can go wrong in a mine. But I did believe we were safe from the moon spawn. We all thought they couldn't get past the runes, so I do understand why Maria and the rest call me a liar. The first day came and went without a hitch, aside from Tomas nearly impaling Will with his backswing. Oh, you should have heard the scold Norton gave his boy for being careless. Still, I suppose a quick blow to the head would have been a better fate than the one he endured. On the second night, we were sitting around each other, eating our rations, in as jolly a mood as they come, when we heard something echoing from one of the tunnels. We couldn't be sure which one. From the river-carved caverns we sat in, a dozen paths branched out to uncounted places, and any distant noise was hard to pinpoint. It sounded like rocks being shifted about. Now, animals wander into the mines from time to time and get lost down there, making a racket in their panic that echoes through the tunnels for miles. At the time, we dismissed it as a deer blindly knocking into things. I don't think any of us believed it, though. Not when we'd gone through so many passages too narrow for anything large enough to be making noise we could hear so clearly. One of the others joked it was old Mick, a man who was abandoned by his fellow miners a few generations back. He never found his way back up. They say his ghost still wanders the place crying for help and mining what riches he finds along the way. We all laughed it off, at least until the lights went out. I'm not a superstitious man, but lying there in the absolute dark with countless tons of rock above you, it can put some nasty thoughts into your mind. I swear I could hear metal chipping away at stone the whole night through. 
I don't think any of us slept well. The earthquake came the next day. we just finished our work and were heading back to the larger tunnel to fill our bellies when the earth began to shake. Now, I can assure you, no beast you've ever heard has made a sound near as terrifying as the sound of the earth bellowing as it tries to crush you forever inside its gullet. We braced ourselves, throwing our bodies against the walls and meager supports in an effort to keep them up. We were just a few men, though and the beams were far from stable. Rocks began to fall and the earth had swallowed us whole. Something came down on my head and, well, if things could have gone darker, they would have. When I came to, there was nothing but the sounds of moaning and weeping. I quickly joined them. With how deep we have to go, there are no rescue parties that'll get there in time to help the dying. They don't bother recovering corpses either. Anyone lucky would have been able to worm themselves out. From the sounds of things, though, Luck weren't on our side today. My arms were free, at least. But something was pinning my leg and my head throbbed something fierce. I flailed about in the dark and smacked my lantern. I fumbled for the light and managed to get it going, though I made sure to keep it low since I didn't know how much air we had. The firelight reflected off some scattered picks and shovels enough that I could see what remained of the passage, which wasn't much. The beam on my leg had half crushed my knee. I'll carry that injury the rest of my life as I'm sure you can see. The beam did keep a slab of rock from flattening it entirely, though, so I counted it as a blessing. Looking around, I couldn't see anyone but Will, who had an arm pinned up to the shoulder by rocks that didn't plan on moving any time soon. Down one way, the tunnel was completely buried. With dread building in my chest, I twisted my head all the way back and raised my light to inspect the entrance to our little mine shaft, just a small ways away. To my relief, it had been spared by the quake. Can't say the same about the rest of the men, though. They were all buried behind me, but I could hear their muffled cries. I tried my best to discern who was who, but beneath all that stone and fear, everyone sounded the same. I tried hoisting myself out of my pinned position to moderate success, only to freeze as the aftershocks came rumbling from below. I waited for the tunnel to collapse, for my light to be covered and darkness to shroud me forever. Instead, the muffled moans of my colleagues, my friends, turned to screams. First, there was just one, then another, and another. It quickly became a chorus of wails. I could see the confusion in Will's eyes as he tried to pry out his pinned arm and felt it reflected in my own chest. I cried out to them, asking what was happening to no avail. And then, as quickly as it started... The screams died into a dreadful silence. I listened carefully, but couldn't hear so much as a single moan. Had the earth shifted and crushed them further? It wouldn't have been over that quick if that was the case. Had the tunnel collapsed further in the aftershocks? No, we'd have heard that. I knew straight away whatever was going on wasn't natural. I pried myself out a little further from under the beam, gritting my teeth to keep from crying out. I managed to get out by leveraging a pick beneath the beam, though I left a fair bit of skin behind in the process. Another rumble caught my attention. This time, not from below, but from across the tunnel where the other miners were trapped. And then, I saw it. The moon spawn pushed through the stone like a worm through dirt. Its translucent skin was pallid and wet with blood. Worse, were the faces pushing through the stone like it was butter. I was too terrified to count, but there were at least a dozen ribbed necks extended out from a long, bulbous body, each ending in the face of one of my friends, except they were contorted into a cacophony of panicked screams so loud I thought my ears would burst. I added my own scream to the chorus and crawled back towards the entrance, dragging my light behind me. As I said, the entrance hadn't caved in, but with the damage to my leg I couldn't even stand. I was about to try hauling myself up when I realised Will was still trapped. I turned to see him frozen in terror, eyes locked onto the creature that slowly heaved its bulk towards him. I wanted to help the poor lad, I did, but what could I do against a creature like that if I couldn't even stand? So I just sat there, as it slowly made its way toward him, a metre at a time. He looked at me, pleading with his eyes as it drew slowly closer. No words came to my lips. I just looked back with tears in my eyes. And then it was upon him. The faces of the miners he'd known all his life. The face of his own father tearing into him. 
The poor lad couldn't even fight back with his arm pinned beneath all that weight. Then, one of the faces turned to me, its mouth wide and bloody. I watched in horror as its neck bulged like something beneath the surface of a lake trying to break out. And something did, splitting its skin as it pushed free. Another head grew, and this one bore young Will's face. It screamed. I turned and ran, quickly as my bad leg would allow. The thing followed, but the entrance of the shaft was so narrow that it had to burrow through to catch up. That slowed it down just long enough for me to drag myself into another tunnel and blow out my light. I couldn't escape to the surface, not with my wounded leg. My only chance was to hide and pray to the kindler that it wouldn't find me. I don't know how long I was down there, but I waited with my breath held as it dragged itself through our camp, searching for me. I had to stop myself from weeping as that thing hunted me down with the wails of my dead friends echoing through the tunnels. Eventually, though, the screams died away as it picked some other tunnel and crawled away. I nearly wept with relief in the silence that followed. The next few days get a bit blurry. The pain got worse and a nasty fever took hold of me. I stayed hidden, even when I was certain it was gone. I didn't eat or drink, and by the end of it, I was delirious. A rescue party came eventually. I've been told I tried to fight them off after entering a fit of screaming when I saw their faces. The next time I woke, I was in my own bed. When I asked about the others, I was told I was the only survivor. And when I told my tale, they dismissed it as a feverish recollection. That's what happened, I swear. I realise it sounds mad, I do. Part of me wishes I was mad. That it didn't happen, but it did and it haunts me every moment, waking or sleeping. The worst of it is that nobody believes me. I do. You mean that? What you saw is known as a hydra, a moon spawn that burrows through the earth. On the rare occasion they encounter something living, they devour and claim its face, be it man or beast. Can you kill it then? I cannot. What? You're a bloody night hunter! It's your duty to protect people like us! What good are you if you can't kill something terrorizing the common folk? People die down there. Good people! And you're just gonna sit there and refuse to do anything about it? If I could help, I would. Unfortunately, hydras make for slippery prey. They never stick to the same hunting grounds for long. The one that did this is likely already gone, digging into deeper and darker places. I can't track something through solid stone. Oh, that's rich. Here come the excuses. I thought the merchant lords were bad enough hiding in their guarded manners, but at least they don't try to pretend there's something they're not. You're no hero. I never claimed to be one. And how could you? My grandfather was a night hunter. I know how the oath goes. It sounds to me like you've gone against the code. More than you could ever know. Lynn, what did I say about causing a scene? You're done here. I was just leaving. This man won't be of any help anyway. I did warn you, hon. It's no trouble. Sure didn't seem that way. His tale wasn't a lie. The moon spawn he spoke of does exist. If you could tell the other townsfolk, I'd appreciate that. He shouldn't be shunned after what he went through. Where are you going? I plan on investigating the claim of a moon spawn along the mountain road. Is your head on crooked? It's nearly dark. Let me prepare a room. Lem was right about one thing. I have an oath to keep. From dusk till dawn, I keep my watch. I always travel by night. I see. May a silver moon light your path, Night Hunter. In my experience, the blessings of the Kindler rarely extend into the wild. Nonetheless, I appreciate the sentiment. Stay well, friend. Hey there, Ryan here. Creator, writer, and director of Best Jerry of a Night Hunter. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I just wanted to take the time to give a special thank you to Kyle Datu and Bridget for their generous support on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and make sure to stay tuned for more episodes coming soon. If you're interested in supporting this project, make sure to check out the Patreon page, 
where we have rewards that will include voting on monsters that appear in the shorts, behind-the-scenes content, and unused assets.